Thank you very much. All right, so thank you to everybody so much for coming. My name is Hassan, as introduced. Uh, I'm an Equifel Fellow at the Toronto General, and I just want to take an opportunity to just thank everybody for coming, and especially for uh, Tyus and Rob for inviting me to come here and talk to you about this. Um, so uh, to be honest, the easiest thing for me to do in these rounds would have probably been talk to you about smoking cessation or tobacco control, because that's something that I have a great deal of uh, background and educational experience in. But I thought it would be interesting to talk about uh, digital health, which is a, a new passion of mine and interest of mine that I wanted to pursue further. Um, so uh, I guess we'll uh, initiate the talk. Um, so I'm just going to make sure. There it is. So I don't have any particular disclosures, uh, no funding from any sort of uh, bodies, but I have been involved in a couple of apps that are developed. They're not for profit and primarily for educational purposes. In terms of the table of contents, in terms of what I hope to discuss with you today, just a brief uh, discussion about what actually is digital health, what is described under the category of digital health, or at least how we'll describe it for the purposes of this talk. Um, how can digital health impact um, patient care, physicians, healthcare systems? Uh, hopefully delve into uh, just a brief literature uh, review of how digital health has been assessed, uh, not only in a few trials, but also in a number of systematic reviews. And then hopefully discuss digital health in action, um, both uh, with the local uh, projects that are ongoing, as well as one that I uh, have been working on in recent times. So as with any grand rounds or any rounds, we're always told to make sure to anchor it to a case. And I think this would be a very important and pertinent one. So let's say you have a patient who's a 50-year-old individual coming in with an inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. They've received their stenting. They've been put on all the appropriate drugs. Um, and uh, you know they, they happen to be a hypertensive who smoked, uh, of course, got connected to the Ottawa smoking model, um, which is uh, as good as it gets. Um, and then we're discharged, uh, and there's a plan for outpatient follow-up with a cardiologist as well as a referral to cardiac rehab. Um, unfortunately, the patient doesn't attend cardiac rehab, citing a number of barriers that we'll briefly chat into. Now, um, this may seem like a made-up example, but uh, it's actually more common than you'd imagine. Actually, majority of the cases, unfortunately, um, some evidence suggesting that only 20% to 25% of patients that are referred to cardiac rehab that actually show up to cardiac rehab. So the majority of patients not showing up, clearly a barrier in, uh, in care. And just along those lines, um, not that that's the purpose of this talk, we know for a fact that cardiac rehab is excellent for patients, not only in terms of their quality of life, in terms of their morbidities, as well as prolonging life and improving mortality. So it is really an important challenge for us to deal with. So taking a step back, so what is digital health? Um, I'm not going to survey everybody here as I would otherwise, but if people have things, they, they're welcome to shout it out. But this is uh, kind of a definition through the WHO and the Ontario Health Team and the mandate that they've, they've developed. So using digital technology, digital, mobile or wireless technology to support health objectives. Now, within this, uh, you could be looking at a very broad area. So, uh, you know, obviously we have telemedicine and a lot of people are utilizing OTN for seeing uh, patients even when they're at a distance through e-consultation. There's web-based strategies, whether there's websites that can provide information. Um, there's email and ensuring that there's follow-up mechanisms built in. Mobile phones, whether it's through calling or texting, interactive voice response smartphone applications, which I'll hopefully talk about, um, wearable monitors, and then things that I haven't even mentioned on here and I'm probably not going to get into for the for purposes of this talk is, you know, social media, uh, deep machine learning, AI, that stuff hasn't really been very aggressively tested and uh, assessed in cardiovascular prevention, which is why I'm not going to go into it, but, you know, humongous area for us uh, to potentially seek. And what makes me very interested and passionate about this area is the fact that we are relatively early in its assessment and implementation. And so there's a lot of opportunity, not just for people such as myself, but senior, mid-career, early, trainees, everybody. There's a lot of opportunity in this area. So how does digital health impact our patient care? So this is an example, again, uh, um, that I received from the WHO and, uh, and adapted. So at the patient level, at the health professional level, and the health uh, system organization level, there's clearly benefits, and I'm going to get into in, in, in the following slides, but um, it's important to recognize that at the patient level, you know, there's a great deal of power in having one's own personal records, um, whether that's being able to share those records with other physicians that they may come across, whether it's for them to know themselves. 
Um, it's extremely important for patients to know their diagnosis. So there's been studies where patients are discharged after a heart attack and don't know that they were coming in with a heart attack or that's what their diagnosis was or that they were cured of their heart attack. So there can be some misinformation that is there. Having um, technology or having that information and feedback on a consistent basis can be utilized in the process of not only ensuring that information is passed on, but you can actually use this as a mechanism of management. Um, we were just talking prior to, our con to, this, uh, to this rounds about how important it is to have um, you know, a structured manner of being able to access records from somebody who might have had an echo yesterday at an outside lab or another hospital, and now they're coming in with chest pain and shortness of breath and you know, um, a lot of redundancies that can be built in. Well, we can avoid all of these unnecessary testing potentially by having the patient having that information. Reminders, motivations can help not only in terms of adherence to medications, but attending to, con uh, to their appointments. There can be red flags. There's now heart failure applications that are obviously measuring how much weight somebody might have gained, um, you know, and other factors relating to that. Improving patient experiences and health outcomes, which is really what we're in the business of doing research and providing care for, is this is this such this is such an important uh, piece within the healthcare system is to ensuring that the patients that are coming through are getting the best experience and the best outcomes, and of course um, there's benefit in terms of reducing costs potentially from programs that are not necessarily based within the walls of an institution, for example, but are actually decentralized to areas where um, people can show up more easily in their own communities, not have to pay for parking, not have to pay for transit, not have to take days off from work. So at the patient level, humongous impact that's potentially available. At the healthcare provider level, so again, as a healthcare provider, if I have records of a patient that has visited I don't know, some other hospital, whether it's in Ontario or elsewhere, those things are extremely important in terms of acute as well as chronic management. Um, there are point of care tools that I'm sure every single person in here, if I asked you to put your hand up, if you use a point of care tool, you'd say yes. Um, every single one of us use it, whether it's up to date, whether it's some sort of a calculator, etc. And these tools have been extremely helpful for physicians whether it's communication in a privacy compliant manner, um, e-referrals and scheduling, remote monitoring and management of patients, um, online modules, whether it's to train trainees or admin in your office, a lot of powerful um, tools uh, and access from this. And then medication interactions and errors. Again, most uh, EMRs nowadays will point these out and you really, like at Toronto, if anybody's ever worked at Toronto and had to enter things into EPR, like uh, they won't enter medications until you've approved, you accept that there might be an interaction. And sometimes those are major interactions that you didn't think of and you really need to make sure that warfarin and DFT prophylaxis aren't on at the same time. And so, you know, they have the ability to avoid these near misses and, and hopefully reduce errors. And at the healthcare system level, and this is, again, um, we've had a lot of engagement and interaction with one of the other apps that I'm working on. But um, again, not only is it a matter of physician and patient satisfaction and feeling, you know, motivated and interested and keen, um, avoiding duplicating tests, but efficient workflows. One of the biggest areas, at least I know that when we've had surveys within Toronto General and Hamilton when I was there, one of the biggest reasons for burnout is people, they're just like inefficient workflows. They feel like they're being extremely overworked for tests that may not be necessary um, and trying to build in efficiency so we don't necessarily have to overburden our healthcare system. Um, having surveillance of diseases, I'm not going to, uh, this is the talk is not meant to be about coronavirus, but there is actually some, uh, there was an individual who created an AI based mechanism to be able to recognize that this outbreak is about to happen like two weeks ago or something before any of this stuff happened and using deep machine learning and AI, they were able to demonstrate that. That's something that could be easily be utilized in, in, in this way. Um, analyzing lar large data uh, bases as well as impact on health outcomes. So clearly there's a tremendous impact that we can have at every single level using digital health and improving the flow and, and efficiency of care. So uh, this isn't just me and my ideas. A lot of these are um, actually taken from this, this playbook and strategies that the Ontario government has actually created. They've made it a strong mandate uh, to try to digitize or improve the digital health component of the Ontario health teams that are coming out. And they have this 150 page playbook, which I did go through most of it, but a lot of it I have to admit are appendices. Um, but they literally go through a playbook in a step-by-step -step way with resources that are available and I'd highlight 
it as a potential resource for somebody, whether it's administration or, or otherwise, to have a look at. Um, and it goes over the benefits of digital health, what available health resources that are available in digital health, um, their push towards an integrated system and how they plan to have innovation and expansion, as well as review of current support structures that exist to help support health teams to get more digital and digi digitized. Um, again, adapted from their document about how, you know, improving communication and collaboration among healthcare providers, timely access to updated information, avoiding duplication and unnecessary costs, uh, improving clinical decision making, which is obviously extremely important, reducing administrative burden as we discussed, um, information management, learning resources and productivity and efficiency. So um, really important components. Well, what's it, this all sounds like a great idea. Um, you know, clearly not everybody has an, well, maybe a lot, there's a lot of apps going around, I have to admit, but, you know, there are certainly barriers to digital, digitizing or digital health, and these are some of the barriers that they had mentioned and I'd found from other sources as well. Um, obviously, there is that friction, you know, we talk about uh, kinetic and, and static friction, so from the setup standpoint, you have to have some sort of an idea as to what you want to do, and usually there's no shortage of ideas. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of cool things that you can do with this in this world. You usually need a team to help set it up. And, um, you know, even myself working a little bit in silos because over the last few years, it's not something that has been readily available to work in a lot of teams that are doing this. Um, but it's important to have different experts and expertise. As I was chatting uh, over the course of yesterday, you know, if you were to ask me if I could go back and if I would do a programming degree to be able to develop apps, I'm not sure if I would do that because I went into my career choice of going into medicine to practice medicine, et cetera. Coming up with ideas and thinking big picture and evaluating them, that's kind of the stuff I'm interested in, which may be different from others, but you need a team of programmers and user interface individuals, et cetera. Um, and that sometimes that infrastructure isn't there. Um, and definitely I'm, I'm very happy and proud to say that in Ottawa, that is definitely something that's coming and changing and, and, and you know, we can hear more about that later. Um, having uptake of users so you can have the greatest app in the world but if you're if the target audience isn't actually using or utilizing that app then it's not going to make or whatever the product it is it's not really going to make much of a difference because you're not going to have users and they're not going to be engaged and then it's going to be completely wasted so making sure that you're going to the stakeholders at the initial development standpoint at the initial development of your product or your app to involve them you know, whether it's the uh, director of the CCU or the director of the cath lab, making sure that they're involved and engaged and making sure that any aspects that they think would help in engagement would be incorporated. So important to have a team-based uh, approach. Um, it costs money to develop apps, tens of thousands of dollars. It costs money to develop these things, platforms. Um, takes a lot of time and requires a lot of trained professionals and there has to be a commitment not only at the individual level whether it's a physician or a researcher but at the institution level and at the government and policy level and you know it seems at least we're moving in that direction now I have to admit having gone to ESC and the European side of cardiology and gone to ACC the Europeans are definitely way far ahead of us um, and even the US but I think, you know, with our government and with our institutions, we're, we're moving in that direction. I, I definitely see a lot of growth in this area. Um, maintaining privacy, uh, you'd be, it's, unless one is involved in this process, you don't appreciate just how challenging and complicated it is to try and maintain privacy. Um, and the, not only is it that you have to maintain it, but the proof that you have to do it can take a year or so. And that actually happened with our app, uh, looking at STEMI activation, to the point where by the time you've proven that the privacy is accurate and it works, the app is now obsolete and you literally have to reprogram the app. So it's unfortunately or fortunately, it's a moving target continuously because the programming languages continuously change. And that can also be a bit of an issue because you have to continuously change with it and you need to be committed and motivated. In terms of its maintenance, of course, you want to have this accurate and updated information as possible. You want to know what is going to happen in the worst case scenario. If my app or my, pro my website or whatever might stop working, what impact is that going to have? Is that going to mean an extra visit or is that going to mean a delay of an hour in terms of STEMI activation? Those are very different. And so, you know, making sure that even if that if there are failures, which can happen in anything, to have some sort of a backup mechanism that is available, there should be 24-hour su support, et cetera. 
And then evaluating the effectiveness and feasibility, that takes time and effort as well. Um, in terms of other barriers that I've seen from speaking with patients, um, they really enjoy that social network of coming to cardiac rehab or prevention. And for us to just digitize everything, they would lose that human touch of seeing patients, of seeing colleagues, others who've gone through it, others who can mentor them that may have had a heart attack five years ago and now have just had a fresh heart attack. So there is that component and we do need to keep the patients always in mind in providing patient-centered care. There are unforeseen and unintended consequences. For example, now, you know, most if not everybody has a cell phone in Canada, I would imagine, a lot of, lot of access to smartphone. And there's actually studies that show 95% of the entire world's population is covered by a telecommunication network. So, you know, you can easily reach 95%, 7 billion plus people. Not everybody has a smartphone, but those numbers are like 70 to 75% of people. But you still have to keep in mind that if you're going to do a study that's primarily based on smartphone as an, a way of reaching patients, only those that have a smartphone or are able to use a smartphone are going to be able to benefit from it. So you don't want to leave out our older populations. You don't want to leave out people who can't speak English as well. You don't want to leave out the, you know, the most vulnerable in our society, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's those that have um, issues with um, you know, poverty and severe poverty. So it's important to keep all of these in mind and think how you're going to tackle these. So in terms of the literature review, this is by no means a full-on you know, systematic review. People have done these, uh, many of them. And to be honest, you could probably do a systematic review, as you'll see, in like you know, telemedicine or digital health in hypertension, because the field is growing. And it's definitely, there's a lot of evidence that's coming out. Despite that, the numbers, as you'll see in most of these systematic reviews, are tiny. It's like 2,000 patients that were making, um, you know, discrimination based on. So I've broken this down into three major trials uh, as well as three major systematic reviews that I wanted to kind of briefly discuss over the course of some time. Uh, and the first one, and I'm pretty much just getting the ones on the A to B, A, B, C are the ones that are trials, a D, E, F are systematic reviews. And we'll just briefly go through the, the trials, what they found, and you know, hopefully drive home the point as to how significant of an impact these technologies can have in terms of patient outcomes, cardiovascular disease, risk factor management, adherence to medications, et cetera. So uh, this was one of the, actually the first one of the first trials. It was published in 2015 in uh, JAMA. Um, I'm not sure if anybody still or was involved in the Pure study, um, but Clara um, Clara Chow was a lead of this, and she was actually my first supervisor when I first started working at PHRI, even before I got into med school. Um, and uh, we'd work on the tobacco work together. But interestingly enough, she went back to Australia. She was doing a fellowship with Dr. Yusuf. She went back to Australia and became this lead in digital health and like doing digital health related work. Um, and this was one of the first trials that they had worked on uh, called Text Me, looking at tobacco exercise and diet, uh, diet messages. Now, um, and published in JAMA. And uh, interestingly, in this trial, they had 710 individuals, of which 82% were males. And you'll, unfortunately, you will find that a lot of these trials, majority of them are uh, quite heavy in males and, uh, and low in females. And it will be extremely important to engage more of our female uh, patients. These patients had to have a known history of coronary artery disease. And the intervention, um, again, in terms of the fidelity or, or robustness, is just a text message. We're not talking mega AI, big data, or anything like that. It's just a simple text message that they're getting four times a week that's personalized to them about some sort of uh, tobacco exercise or diabetic uh, issue. And they get that over six months. And the other individual just got usual care, whatever that may be, in, in cardiac rehab or outpatient follow-up. Their primary outcome was looking at LDL levels in six months, and then they had secondary outcomes looking at blood pressure, BMI, physical activity, and smoking status. And it was a single a center or a randomized control trial. And um, yeah, and I'm just hearing Rob say this, it seems like it's pretty easy to do. And uh, you know, I'm sure the Ottawa model for smoking and, and everybody, you, there's been way more robust stuff than, than this for sure. And, but this is something that in the population of cardiac rehab and um, prevention was definitely very unique at the time. This is like five, six years ago. So what types of terminologies that, that they use? Now, again, these are pretty straightforward. They're, in terms of the you know, complexity, they're quite basic statements like, don't forget to exercise, it's good for you. You know, like, <laughs> it's not like, they're just like mother, you know, good mother sta statements. It's not like the smoking cessation packets with like the gross teeth and, you know, the 10, 15 different uh, warnings. They're very straightforward, like smoking is bad for you. Um, 
And uh, they were just giving this as a reminder uh, continuously. And this is just uh, the table. I don't want to go into a full-on critical appraisal of all the trials that I'm going to discuss, but just to give you an idea in terms of their outcome, the LDL being their primary outcome, they're able to show uh, a reduction um, by 5 in, in the other one, so divided by 39, I guess, or 40. But statistically significant reduction in LDL in the intervention group. Their systolic blood pressure dropped by almost 8 millimeters of mercury. Uh, BMI dropped by 1.3, which again is, you know, that's quite a lot uh, if you think about it in the world of BMI. Getting uh, physical activity in met minutes per week, which is often what we'll use in cardiac rehab as a measure of how people are doing. Getting it well above the 750 threshold and, you know, 345 met minutes uh, greater than uh, the usual group. And met minutes just being the number of mets times by the number of minutes of exercise they did in that week. So that's a substantial increase in physical activity. And then also a reduction in smoking. And all of these were statistically significant. Published in JAMA, lots of news, like lots of all met altmetric things that we talked about yesterday at dinner. So lots of uh, interest and intrigue in this. Um, so this was among the first, um, you know, done in cardiac patients, cardiovascular prevention patients, where using some sort of a modality like this, they were able to demonstrate uh, a benefit. Um, the next thing, I'm sure you've probably had numerous rounds on this. I'm sure EP and cardiology and everybody has talked about this. I'm not going to go into great detail, but when we talk about wearable monitoring, obviously the New England Journal publication um, about the Apple Heart Study is an extremely important one to discuss and mention. Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, it's always interesting. There's people on both sides of the argument in this, in this particular study, but just to give some nuance, so there's um, pretty much if you had an Apple iWatch, they invited you to participate. If you participated, you're one of those 420,000 patients. That number looks humongous and massive. Um, and pretty much what they wanted to do was to see of patients that self-report never had atrial fibrillation, can the Apple iWatch, through the algorithm that they have, um, potentially, and demonstrating irregular pulse, how does that correlate to actual patients with atrial fibrillation? Like, where, you know, these patients wouldn't have been tested or assessed otherwise, so why would these otherwise healthy people have atrial fibrillation? So, um, of those 420,000 patients approximately, I'm just going to round up, only about 2,100, 2,200 actually had an irregular pulse, and that represented, like, less than 0.5%. So and anytime somebody had an irregular pulse, they said, we're going to send you this packet of like a, a patch that you put on for 14 days, and we're going to actually measure your electrocardiogram to see if you have atrial fibrillation. Now, unfortunately, their retention rate, again, wasn't very high because only about a quarter of those patients ended up send, getting that package and then putting it on and then returning it. But of that 420,000 uh, individuals, 450 returned their ECG. Um, the intervention in this particular group, obviously looking at the Apple monitoring watch and the presence of atrial fibrillation patient screen to have an irregular pulse. So of those 450 patients who returned their ECG, which is, you know, a quarter of those that had an irregular pulse, about 34% had atrial fibrillation. Um, and if, so, you know, that's a substantial number in an otherwise healthy population who does not, well, they self-report not having atrial fibrillation and is just randomly wearing a watch and is able to be in a third of cases accurately mentioning that you have atrial fibrillation and had a positive predictive value of 84%. Now you could do all the sensitivity analysis in the world and find that, assume that those t other 1,500 patients had nothing and then that number looks measly small because, you know, 34% out of 450 may turn into, you know, like 4% and the negative, the positive predictive value may change quite drastically if you're actually going to do a sensitivity analysis assuming everybody who didn't submit something may have been negative. But it's still an interesting study and it just shows the power of digital health. You're able to recruit 420,000 patients in like a matter of no time. Like it's unbelievable as to what they're able to do. So even as a proof of concept it was a very interesting and cool study. So these uh, just show, uh, figure two just shows uh, irregular pulse notifications according to age and gender. And you see that um, obviously as you get older, you, you're more likely to have um, um, notifications. And then similarly, as expected, the older patients that had those notifications were more likely to have atrial fibrillation. So we're actually capturing true atrial fibrillation in these patients. So again, very interesting study that came out recently, a lot of work. I know a lot of people are interested in doing more work with Apple and Google and et cetera. So, um, you know, for the trainees that might be interested, there's actually like uh, fellowships and training internships that you can actually go to Google or, or Apple to work with them. So something to consider.
The last trial I'll talk about is a tele-rehabilitation model um, with the remote CR trial. And it looked at not only the effects, but also the cost of doing an in-house you know, a cardiac rehab program compared to doing a uh, distance-based or you know a home program type uh, of a pro uh, cardiac rehab, um, and this is becoming more and more prevalent. To be honest, having been working at the Toronto Rehab Institute recently, having working with the McMaster Group, um, and having chats uh, with the group here, like there is a big push to say for the benefit of patients and patient satisfaction, for the benefit of physician and physician satisfaction and the healthcare system at every level. If we can try to avoid people coming into hospitals for these types of services and do it just as well, if not better, then that would be a wonderful thing. So in this particular um, trial, they actually just wanted to show that it was non-inferior. They don't want to show it's superior because if it's non-inferior to an traditional inpatient or not inpatient but like in hospital program and it's you know they love it way more and it's way cheaper then you can make the argument that why not just do something that's not any less or you know not any worse than an inpatient or in hospital one so they had 162 patients again 86 percent male and they all had known coronary artery disease and um, the intervention group which had about 80 patients had remotely delivered cardiac rehab and the usual center based had um, just the usual cardiac rehab and they looked at outcomes at 12 weeks as well as 24 weeks and their primary assessment was vo2 max and um, for all the you know epidemiologists methodologists are like what like that's not even, what kind of an outcome is that? It's a surrogate outcome. You know, VO2 max is a surrogate outcome, meaning it's not the outcome that a patient cares about. Like, what is my VO2 max? You know, like, um, not a lot of people care about it, but it is well associated with um, outcomes, whether it's hospitalization um, and mortality. Other things that they looked at included lipids, glucose, BMI, pretty much every single risk factor, and mentioned uh, you know, any adverse events and quality of life assessment. And they actually found in their trial that it was non-inferior for this VO2 max outcome, and there was absolutely no difference in the secondary outcomes, um, no significant differences between them. And <clears throat> when they did their cost analysis, um, they, and this was done in New Zealand, I should mention, uh, a single center trial, um, but the cost of a remote program is about 5,000 New Zealand dollars, and the cost of a center-based model was about 10,000, so it's about half the price um, for what apparently are no significant difference, or at least non-inferior, and no significant secondary outcome differences. Now, again, I'm speaking to a cardiology audience, so I'm sure you guys are scratching your head and be like, are you, are you crazy? You're presenting a trial of 160 people? Like, we're used to tens of thousands. Like, appreciate that. But, you know, as technology is developing and, and pilot studies are being done, there is a definite need for expansion and more evidence that needs to happen. But again, another good example, um, you know, at least in New Zealand, where they were able to find that this remote model was non-inferior with no significant differences in outcomes. So now we'll just briefly chat about systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Um, so first we'll talk about uh, one that was published um, um, on digital health interventions for prevention of cardiovascular disease um, at, in the Mayo Clinic uh, proceed, uh, proceedings. And in this, uh, they looked at patients who, were, who had coronary artery disease or were at risk of having coronary artery disease. Their intervention was any sort of digital health intervention, and they described it as like telemedicine, web-based strategies, emails, mobile phones, mobile applications, text messaging, monitor sensing, etc. And their control group was uh, whenever they were when they were doing the analysis. So whenever there was a control group that was a non-digital based, so that may just be quote unquote usual care as we often see in whatever the cardiac rehab or the cardiologist team is going to do, and that's what's going to happen. Um, but it just could not be a digital health intervention. And what they found were their outcomes, so I'm just presenting um, the CAD outcomes, BMI and weight, which were the significant ones that changed. Um, you see that CAD outcomes are reduced quite substantially with a relative risk of 6, 0.61 uh, and a p-value of 0.002. Um, a weight loss of about three and a half pounds, again, statistically significant. Um, and I've put on the side, as you can see over here, that those are in nine studies, because um, not every single study may have measured those outcomes, but 2,263 uh, patients, 2,500 in the next. And then with BMI, again, a 0.6 uh, reduction in BMI, and that was done in 21 studies in like 17,000 patients, so quite substantial. And these, this was a forest plot at the bottom. And so this is broken down now by primary, secondary prevention and heart failure. But the point estimate at the bottom, as you can see, is favoring digital health quite substantially, not crossing one, suggesting it is statistically significant. Um, and at the worst end of it, like still a, a um, 
risk reduction of 0.8. Um, the second uh, systematic review is looking at mobile health and secondary prevention, and that was published in the CJC um, a, few, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, in this one, they looked at uh, patients with uh, coronary artery disease, 27 studies, about 5,000 patients. And again, they were more focused not necessarily on the entirety of digital health, but more so on mobile health technology. And again, control was usual care. Now, I should mention and just give you a sidetrack. So um, when they mentioned mobile health, that's not apps and stuff. 90% of these, 95% of these studies were the text messaging apps that we kind of mentioned, and they're the, kind of like the low fidelity type of digital health. Um, but still, they had uh, very interesting outcomes. So medical adherence, odd ratio for those that were in the mobile health group of 4.5 um, with a very significant p-value. Blood pressure targets that were much, at odds ratio of 2.8, very statistically significant. Um, interestingly, no significant difference in smoking cessation um, or lipid reduction, but again, I don't want to be, uh, and sorry, this is a point estimate for the medication adherence, and you know, even when they did this for medication adherence or you know, non-pharmacological and pharmacological adherence, both were extremely favorable of mobile health. I posted this table, and I know it's busy, so I don't want you to read every single you know, uh, point of it. But the point of me showing it is if you actually look at the numbers, um, you know, we're making conclusions on smoking cessation not being helped by mobile health based on very few patients. So we have to keep that in mind. Anytime these systematic reviews come in, as one of my mentors, Gordon Guy, it says, it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you're going to meta uh, do a systematic review and meta-analyze data that is weak, then you're going to get a weak systematic review and meta-analysis. That's not to say that this is a weak systematic review meta-analysis, just to say that we need to be cautious and look at the numbers whenever we're making these uh, dis distinctions, either for or against any sort of uh, intervention. Definitely more research is needed. We're right at the beginning of it. And then this is something that I found, it's actually in print, it's not even actually completely published. It was done by a UHN group, um, Digital Health Counseling, and more of the psychiatry and cardiology group, um, and looking at hypertension. Um, and uh, they looked at 17 trials in about 6,000 patients, again, 67% of whom were male, and guideline-directed digital counseling. Um, and they, again, found a significant, and they were just looking at high blood pressure, and they found a significant reduction in blood pressure um, with a p-value that's also very, very significant with a mean follow-up, 7.7 months. Um, and the forest plot, again, favoring the uh, digital health uh, intervention. So a very quick uh, rundown of some of the major studies and systematic reviews that have come out in the area. Um, that's not to take anything away from, uh, I just want to mention that um, Obviously, probably the best program that exists in smoking cessation, the smoking model, is the, the program in Ottawa. And uh, the work that's been done by the group here is spectacular. And there's a lot of digital components to that, um, whether it's the follow-ups and telephone calls. So it's, there's something uh, really to be proud of. I just wanted to demonstrate some of the other uh, um, you know, ideas that are also out there. But that's not to say that it, there isn't wonderful stuff being done here. And along those lines, it really segues really well. I didn't actually plan this, but it segues really well into the digital health in action uh, point that I wanted to talk about. So the first, um, and whenever I've given rounds in any of the, uh, the hospitals, I always try to, um, you know, because this is a diverse group of individuals that come to rounds. Um, some may not be as, you know, have on the hand on the pulse as much as maybe others may have. And so it's important to review what resources you have available. And you guys in Ottawa are extremely lucky. Like, it's so, it's not even funny how lucky you are based on the prevention and rehab program that exists, before, based on the leadership, based on the support uh, that exists for prevention and rehab. So there's really, really strong work being done here. So the virtual care program is actually, that's nothing to do with anybody other than Ottawa. So Ottawa is, uh, you know, I, I was randomly looking, I was obviously doing an extensive search, not randomly looking, but uh, one of the things that I came across was this program in Ottawa called the virtual care program. I'm by no means an expert in this. There's people in the back and throughout this room that are by far way more in terms of their expertise about this program, but I just wanted to tell you about um, if you haven't, how many people have heard about this program? Hand up. Okay. So about half, that's, that's not bad at all. So um, in terms of the Ottawa model, again, a true trailblazing, leading, uh, world-renowned institute, in especially in the prevention rehab, in addition to the other, other clinical and research activities. But there are such diverse selections of programs one can be involved in, whether it's from the prevention side of things or the rehabilitation side of things. 
and there's uh, excellent expertise that exists, whether it's a spoken cessation program, cardio prevent, um, the postpartum program, women at heart, diabetes, heart wise exercise program. And then from the rehab side of things, there are, you know, you can literally pick and choose what you want to do. I want to be um, on site. Great, you can be on site. I want to be home based. Okay, come for your initial visit and we'll arrange for everything to be done at home. Um, brief intervention, somebody comes for once and you give them advice and they kind of go on their way thereafter. And then this virtual care program, which um, you know, I'll tell you briefly about, but um, uh, is in the process of being evaluated as well at this standpoint. So um, some of these, uh, I apologize for the grainy pictures, I did find them on Google uh, and or provided by resources uh, from the team. So um, actively pati pati um, activating patients to proactively manage health um, relating to their heart. So it's an online platform, um, reliable, up-to-date information that's continuously up-to-date and, uh, you know, made sure that it's uh, reliable, remote monitoring with real-life coaching. People can enter their stats about, I don't know how many people here use, like, MyFitnessPal or anything like that. No? No, but, oh, one person. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. I found it to be very helpful. But, um, you know, there's remote monitoring. People can enter things. It can actually sync with your MyFitnessPal if you wanted to, apparently, like, you know, like there's ability to sync with fitness uh, apps. Um, there's real-time coaching and uh, people who are experts in that area that can provide coaching to your patients from a distance. Um, whether it's through modules or directly uh, through telephone calls. Um, there's personalized goals and monitoring. I'm very much, um, I'm sometimes a bit overly competitive. And so if somebody sets me a challenge, I'm way more aggressively going to be working towards getting those calories down or doing a workout extra. And there's different challenges that are included to try to motivate patients as well. There's reminders and notifications, as you've seen from other um, projects that that has been very helpful in adherence to medications, adherence to coming into appointments. There's online support groups. So, um, you know, I was chatting with some of the, the team leads uh, yesterday. And um, one of the things that we hear about when people don't come into a program is I, I miss that contact to be able to talk to somebody who's gone through it before me. Well, there is a mechanism that's built into this platform as well. Um, access to health experts as well as circle of care. Like this is cool. Like you can invite your family doctor, you can invite your cardiologist, you can invite your mom and your sister who are your, you know, cheerleaders who can help. They'll get access to your entire portfolio and see, hey, are you keeping up with your goals? So there's actually like checks and balances in place. It's really like high fidelity, robust stuff compared to what exists currently. This is just uh, what the, you know, the face sheet of a tracker may look like. Um, and, you know, you have care plans, you have your trackers for blood pressure, your, your, you know, how you feel, um, health library. So it's very, very robust in that way. And able to provide a personalized patient-centered approach, reducing barriers to attend cardiac rehab for those patients that say, hey, listen, I don't have, you know, I, I, I can't make it in, as we'll talk about our case very shortly. Feedback, motivation, real-time uh, uh, reinforcements, having goal setting making sure they have social networks, reminders and notifications. So now when we go back to our case, you know, you ask that patient, hopefully we all talk to our patients when they say, hey, I don't want to do what you want to tell me to do. And these, I, you know, as much as I wanted to make these up, I actually went and looked at barrier, I typed in Google, like barriers to cardiac rehab. And the first thing that showed up was like a, a paper that looked at the most common reasons that somebody had or people, patients had given in a large study about why they don't show up to cardiac rehab. And some of them were like, I don't need it. Whether it was because they didn't know they had had a heart attack or because they thought, hey, I exercise enough, I don't need it. Um, I'll manage on my own. They don't have the ability to take time off work. They don't have to, the ability to travel to their appointments. They don't have, it's far, like, you know, especially a regional center like Ottawa or any other large regional center, you're providing care not just to people in the city, you're providing it to everywhere else and coming into appointments can be challenging. Um, you know, they can say, hey, listen, I've got internal medicine, endocrinology, diabetes, cardiology, and now you want me to come to another appointment? Like, I don't have time for this. Um, so hopefully we all highlight the importance of cardiac rehab because cardiac rehab is one of those very few things that have been shown to, again, not only improve quality of life, but actually reduce mortality, improve quality, uh, you know, and imp uh, reduce mor morbidity. So this would be, I would imagine, a great person to be considered for some sort of a home-based program or, in our example, we'll say in Ottawa, the heart, the, vi uh, you know, the virtual care program. Now, I think that in and of itself probably can and should be a separate rounds and people should talk about the amazing work that has happened. I have n no 
specific interaction with it, just to say that I really genuinely appreciate it. And having spoken to the team members, there's studies that are evaluating this program and platform um, that hopefully will really add very robust and interesting data going forward. Now, in the last, I'm just going to see what time it is, so I'm not overly running over time, not bad. Um, so in the last five minutes, I'm just going to talk to you about a digital health uh, technology and intervention that we had created um, when I was in uh, residency at McMaster. Um, so I'm, this may not be relevant to the cardiology residents here, but in Hamilton, at least, I can tell you. So if a STEMI happens, um, all STEMIs must be approved by the interventionalist. So um, if they emerge from uh, community hospital calls, they, activate, they can only be activated if the interventionalist give the green light. The interventionalist can only activate it if they've had a discussion with the uh, eMERGE doc as well as have, it, have had a chance to review the ECG in an ideal situation. So just to give you some background, that's not necessarily the case in Ottawa, which is pointed out to me earlier, which is uh, very helpful. So we all appreciate, cardi obviously, heart disease and heart attacks are extremely common, leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And STEMI care, as I've just, in that brief example, described, requires a lot of efficient communication and collaboration. And especially in our rural and remote communities, this can be very challenging. There's over 7,000 STEMIs in Ontario, and we know based on numerous guidelines from every single body that if you're coming to a PCI-capable center, so percutaneous coronary intervention uh, center, you should be getting uh, door to balloon time or your PCI or infer time to first intervention within 90 minutes. And if you're coming to a non-PCI-capable center, so a community hospital that doesn't have a cath lab, within 120 minutes. In Ontario, um, we're doing very poorly, um, and I'm not, I've purposefully hidden the left side, or I guess, yeah, Stage, stage left. Um, I've hidden the hospitals themselves because, just for privacy, but in Ontario, only 49% of patients are actually meeting that for patients presenting to a PCI-capable centre. That means more than half of them are not hitting that 90-minute door-to-balloon time. And when you talk about non-capable centre, it's even worse. It's only 44% of the patients presenting to a non-PCI-capable non centre, they're actually hitting that target. So in the current model, as I said, patients can either call 911 or show up uh, with self, you know, by themselves. They can show up to a PCI-capable center or non-PCI-capable center, and then semi-activation can occur with transfer to a cath lab. But timely assessment and diagnosis can sometimes be a challenge, and case review and STEMI team assessment and activation by the interventional cardiologist can be a challenge and, and take up time. But then the most important thing, especially with weather, if it's snowing and icy outside, uh, time to transfer to a PCI-capable center. Uh, for the purpose of this uh, issue, we're going to deal specifically on the case review. So typically when the case review happens, the eMERGE doc has diagnosed STEMI in the hospital. And now they're going to pick up the phone and call the interventionalist. And the interventionalist will hear the story and then has three options for potentially getting that ECG. And remember, it's a STEMI, so it has to have ST elevation on the ECG. And if you don't have the review of the ECG or somebody isn't sure about that, then it's not really truly a STEMI that needs to come in immediately. And that ECG is ideally supposed to be faxed over, um, or unfortunately, oftentimes, either there's no review or, or there's, you know, text sent. And based on that, the interventionalist decides, I'm going to accept this or decline it, and then a transfer is made. And we all know fax, you know, if you're the interventionalist sitting at home, you may not have access to the fax machine, and this is often the case. So you're either getting text messages or you're saying, okay, I guess I'll trust what you have to say and go ahead and activate the team. Text messages, as I mentioned, are fast, but they're not secure, and oftentimes ECGs will have stickers and patient health information, and there's huge issues with privacy. And if you don't review it, there is a potential risk of increasing false activation, which is extremely costly. So what we did, again, my friend, my colleague and I, were like, okay, well, how can we simply come up with an intervention to in Hamilton and, and beyond to try to improve this? So, okay, we're going to create a smartphone application that allows communication between interventionalists and eMERGE docs that'll have a unique privacy-compliant login credential. There will be no storage on any of the devices. Everything is encrypted. Everything is time uh, and date stamped, as well as the email. And if the interventionalist wants, for purposes of documentation, because you know it's three in the morning and they don't remember the patient's name, whether it's documentation or enumeration based, they can put a sticky note on that ECG and associate that name with something that they said. Oh, I did not accept this patient because they're critically, you know, whatever reason that they want to say that they did not feel that transfer was necessary. So the app looks like this. You could either go through the educational component or you can just activate the STEMI team immediately and activate the protocol, in which case it's going to take you to this screen where you're allowed to take up to three pictures. You upload it, and when you press the call interventionalist number, it takes you to the interventional self, uh, telephone. And at the same time that you're telling them about the story about your 50-year-old male with an inferior STEMI um, that you feel is coming in, they can say, okay, give me one sec, and they just pull it up on their app 
and hopefully at that time say, yep, that's a STEMI, go ahead and activate. Whereas historically what happens is, okay, send me the fax machine, and then you go into the cath lab, and you get busy, and then you come back and you're like, that's a STEMI, okay, find the emerge doc for me, he's moved on to another, he or she has moved on to another patient, and there's delays that can happen. Other features that we've included include like reminders and um, you know, important timely review and diagnoses of things, um, diagnosis, risk stratification, contraindications for fibrinolytics, and hopefully we're hoping to show that it improves communication with immediate ECG review, reducing the timing of care, reducing false activation, which is actually from the health system's perspective a humongous burden um, in terms of the cost, not only for money, but in terms of resources, whether people are post-call or, or what have you, providing up-to-date information for our end users as well as a feedback mechanism for eMERGE docs. Um, so we're just in the process of starting a feasibility study. It's been like a literally two or three years process to try to get this off the ground. Just goes to show how much work it takes um, to actually um, make these things happen. Um, and yeah, that was the thing that we had presented at CCC and uh, we're proud to win the cardiovascular competition and receive some funding to further pay our developers to do some additional work on the apps. Um, so just to summarize, because we um, want to leave some time for questions. Digital health, use, use of technology um, and digital mobile wireless technology to support health objectives. Um, there's humongous potential and impact at the patient, physician, as well as the healthcare system level. Current evidence, although there's definitely scope for continuing expansion of evidence development uh, based on you know, the reviews that we have, but at least the current evidence is certainly supportive of it. Patients enjoy it. Physicians enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> you know, every uh, healthcare team member enjoys it. There's certainly leadership at the Ottawa Heart Institute um, from every level, having spoken to a number of uh, years, you know, every, everybody here, there's a commitment to proceed with this and very fortunate and lucky uh, to be here and, uh, you know, be a part of that. So really excited to hear about what results come of this study. And then, you know, I threw in a plug for my own app. It's not for profit or anything like that, but, you know, it's a novel mean of STEMI activation that has the potential of changing this old school telephone and fax model that we have. Um, so thank you once again for inviting me and uh, I'll try, to, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have and try to provide any, you know, input and guidance. <laughs>